Okay, so Hagrid was pointing at two ice creams. He obviously had one ice cream in each hand, so does that mean he was using a third arm to be able to point with? And for that matter, why isn't he allowed to come in? Does the proprietor of this shop have a prejudice against half-giants or something? Spoiler warning. This is an in-depth retrospective and story analysis of the entirety of the Harry Potter books, one chapter at a time. If this is your first video in the series, it is highly recommended that you begin watching this series from the beginning, which you can do by going to the playlist that I provide right here. Okay, now that everyone is all caught up, let's continue. So Harry wakes up, thinking it was all a dream, only to awaken to find he's still in the lighthouse, and Hagrid is still sleeping on what's left of the couch. He and Hagrid head off to London to buy Harry's school supplies. Hagrid asks Harry not to mention it if Hagrid uses magic to speed up the boat. Of course, like I said last chapter, whether Harry mentions it or not should be irrelevant because of the trace, but I've already said my piece about that. Also, side note, was this the same boat that Harry and the Dursleys used the previous night to get to the island? If so, does that mean that the Dursleys are now stranded on that island? Anyway, Hagrid says he flew to the island the previous night. However, how exactly he flew is never made clear. His enchanted motorbike he got from Sirius is nowhere to be seen, in Deathly Hallows, it is revealed that Hagrid cannot ride a broomstick, as he is so massive that a broom would just snap under his weight. And flying without the aid of any external devices is a power later revealed in the series to be exclusively for Lord Voldemort. See what I mean when I said in the first chapter that J.K. Rowling clearly hadn't planned everything about this series out from the start? So, Harry and Hagrid journey to the Leaky Cauldron. It's clear that Hagrid is out of his element using muggle means of transport. This begs the question, if Hagrid isn't normally allowed to do magic, then how does he normally get to the Leaky Cauldron? If there was a magical means of getting there that doesn't normally set off the trace, why doesn't Hagrid just use it then? If Hagrid normally uses illegal magic to get there, how has he not gotten in trouble before? If he normally doesn't need to worry about setting off the trace because he normally isn't in close proximity to an underage wizard, except when he's at Hogwarts, which doesn't count anyway, then that would suggest that Hagrid, and by proxy J.K. Rowling, knows full well at this point how the trace works, which means he should know full well that Harry keeping quiet about his use of magic wouldn't do any good anyway. On the way to London, Hagrid points out that the Ministry of Magic's primary job is to keep the Wizarding World a secret from Muggles. Harry asks the extremely valid question of, why exactly wizards have to hide from Muggles? Hagrid gives a rather baffling response to this question. He says that Muggles would constantly want magical solutions to their problems. I have to take issue with that. First of all, why is that a reason to hide? If anything, offering your magical talents for hire could make wizards into extremely valuable members of society. Second, as I will discuss repeatedly during this retrospective series, Muggle technology can actually solve quite a few problems that magic can't. So it's not like Muggles would be reduced to feeling inferior about themselves. A much more plausible reason for why wizards have to hide from muggles would probably be that prejudice against wizards has historically led to persecution of them. While any one wizard would probably mop the floor with any one muggle in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, muggles outnumber wizards a thousand to one. Even if the Dursleys are a minority regarding how much they hate wizards, if even one percent of muggles wanted to persecute wizards or even wipe them out, wizards probably wouldn't be able to stop them. Now, if J.K. Rowling had taken this idea and ran with it, this would have done wonders to give the villains of this series some much needed depth and complexity. Some of the villains would actually be justified in their hatred of muggles. 
Why should we be persecuted just for being who we are? Why should we have to hide from muggles when they should just get over their bigotry and learn to accept people who are different from them? Right now, we're supposed to treat muggles as mere simpletons who persecute wizards simply because they don't know any better. Why shouldn't we just put them in their rightful place? We're the victims here, not them. Muggles just fear what they don't understand, but that's not our fault. This would also present the pure blood radicals in this series in a new light as well. Instead of them simply believing that witches or wizards who come from muggle stock simply have less inherent magical potential than purebloods, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, pure blood radicals could be presented as feeling betrayed by the muggle ones. Like these, the muggle ones are essentially coming from the enemy in camp or something. However, as much as I would love to assume that this is the official lore behind the Harry Potter franchise, much like my theory last chapter of Petunia Dursley being the victim of parental favoritism, nothing I just said actually stands up to scrutiny. There is no point in the entire franchise when the bad guys are even arguably presented as having this motive behind their actions. In fact, in Goblet of Fire, Rowling actually goes out of her way to portray the Death Eaters in the most unsympathetic way possible by having Arthur Weasley explain that they literally don't have any greater motive for torturing muggles than just for fun. So yeah, despite having an infinitely more interesting and even sympathetic reason for why wizards have to hide from muggles practically gift wrapped for Rowling, the only reason we are ever given is muggles would want magic solutions to their problems. That's it. That's all we get. So anyway, the scene in the Leaky Cauldron itself doesn't really advance the plot at all. We are introduced to Professor Quirrell, Harry's first defense against the Dark Arts teacher, but the primary purpose this scene serves is to establish a recurring gag for the first four books of the series, where people get all fanboyish when they meet Harry. So we enter Diagon Alley proper, but before we can buy anything, Harry needs to get some money out of his vault at Green Gods. Hagrid also foreshadows the book's namesake MacGuffin when he retrieves it from a top security vault, although we don't know yet what exactly that thing is. Hagrid explains that there are 17 sickles to a gold galleon and 29 bronze canuts to a sickle. This leads me to one of the biggest and most consistent failures of the entire franchise. Rowling's complete inability to make her wizarding world make sense mathematically. J.K. Rowling has freely admitted that she is terrible at math. First of all, I've never understood that aspect of our culture. Why would you be proud that you're bad at math? It's one thing to admit to your own faults, but why would you proudly admit to being bad at math with your head held high? I mean, imagine if somebody proudly boasted about being unable to read. But anyway, Rowling compensates for her lack of math skills in this series by just pulling numbers out of her ass. If they make sense, they make sense. If they don't, they don't. For example, earlier in this very chapter, a strange woman remarks that dragon liver costs 17 sickles an ounce. So shouldn't she have just said a galleon in an ounce? Later in the series, we'll find that 11 sickles is enough to get a bus ride from Surrey County, England to London, which is a journey of about 2,000 miles rounded down. However, one book later, Fred and George are charging seven sickles for a single canary cream and calling that a bargain. You're telling me that one canary cream is worth the equivalent of a bus ride of 1,272 miles? Oh, but then Rowling had to go and screw this system up even further by giving us an official conversion rate for wizard money into muggle money. After the series concluded, it was revealed that one galleon converted into $7.65 American money. Since we now have an official conversion rate, that means that Rowling's prices either seem ridiculously overpriced or ridiculously underpriced. For example, at the beginning of this chapter, Hagrid pays five canuts for a newspaper as well as an owl's delivery of said newspaper. 
Using the official conversion rate, that means that Hagrid paid the equivalent of 7.76 cents for this entire newspaper and the convenience of having an owl deliver it for him. I know this wasn't a Sunday newspaper, but damn! This also means that the aforementioned 2,000 mile night bus ride to London would have only cost $4.95. And in the Half-Blood Prince, Harry's 1,000 Galleon Triwizard Tournament prize money is able to fund Fred and George's joke shop in its entirety, despite it only being worth about 7,650 bucks. Okay, let's try to rationalize this. Maybe since gold and silver can't just be mass-produced without a Philosopher's Stone, perhaps the Wizarding World has lived for centuries without inflation. So these prices actually make sense when you realize that you have to account for about a thousand years worth of inflation in our world that didn't happen in theirs. Well, actually, no, that doesn't hold up either, because in the book Quidditch Through the Ages, it is revealed that the Golden Snitch in Quidditch became a thing because someone had brought a Golden Snidget to the game and offered a prize of 150 galleons to whoever caught it. And in a footnote, it says that this was the equivalent of about a million galleons today. So it turns out that the Wizarding World does indeed have inflation, just like any other currency. Rowling's abysmal math will rear its ugly head in other parts of the series as well. For example, in Prisoner of Azkaban, the advertisement for the Firebolt says that it can reach top speeds of 150 miles per hour and can reach that speed in 10 seconds. Combine that with the fact that the official length of a Quidditch pitch from goalpost to goalpost is 500 feet. This means that the Firebolt would take between 6 and 7 seconds to make it from one goalpost to the next. This begs the question, what's the point of making a broomstick that can't even reach its full potential in a Quidditch game without the player going out of bounds? All in all, Rowling sucks at math. Okay, that's fair enough. But then again, if she sucks so much at math, why does she so consistently insert math into her stories when even she admits that she doesn't know what she's talking about? Maybe she should keep her stories as math-free as possible, only including numbers when they are absolutely necessary for the plot. That's like a writer agreeing to write a new installment in the Sherlock Holmes franchise, falling flat on his ass, and then making the excuse that he sucks at writing detective stories. Jesus, Rowling, this isn't rocket science, no pun intended. Why would you repeatedly include something in your stories when you freely admit you don't understand the concept yourself? Nobody is forcing you to include anything in these books. You include something in these books because you personally have chosen to include it, and especially after the success of this first book, your publishers were essentially giving you carte blanche on the remaining six installments of the franchise. So why not play to your strengths and focus on the things in the story that you're actually good at? So anyway, Harry starts buying his school supplies. First, Harry gets his robes while Hagrid heads back to the Leaky Cauldron to get himself some booze to cure his motion sickness. You know, maybe wizards could do to actually trade with Muggle technology a bit more often. In the Muggle world, we have an OTC medicine called Dramamine that Hagrid could have taken right before his minecart ride that would totally have prevented him from becoming car sick. Harry slips into a tailor shop to get his school robes, and again, this is the sort of thing where Muggles simply have an edge over wizards. We still have tailors, but they're usually for rather luxurious clothes. For normal clothes, we instead group the clothes into a handful of standard sizes, enabling our clothes to be mass-produced. Even if an article of clothing isn't an absolute perfect fit, it's usually close enough that it ultimately doesn't matter. Anyway, while Harry is getting outfitted, he starts talking to a boy who we'll later learn is Draco Malfoy. Harry hears about the houses of Slytherin and Hufflepuff, and after he gets outfitted, 
Hagrid explains that there's a rumor that Hufflepuff are a bunch of duffers. However, he also says that one of the most controversial lines in the entire franchise, there's not a witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin. Many people who find themselves sorted into Slytherin using real-life sorting tests will often defend Slytherin House as having its reputation unfairly tainted by only a few bad apples. They argue that to claim that Slytherin is evil just because that's where Voldemort came from is like arguing that Germany is evil because that's where Hitler came from, and that all we really need in order to rehabilitate Slytherin's reputation isn't an overhaul of Slytherin's ideals, but rather just to educate people about what the actual majority of Slytherins are actually like. Now don't get me wrong, I effing love the Super Carlin brothers. They seem like incredibly nice guys, and their Harry Potter fan theory videos are absolutely five star. But if we are being completely objective, looking at the facts that we see in the books, and not having our assessment blinded by our own preconceived biases, then I am forced to conclude that, yes, Slytherin is indeed evil. Okay, let me rephrase that. Well, it is not 100% guaranteed that all Slytherins are necessarily evil, the population of evil wizards is clearly weighted in Slytherin's favor. People often like to point Horace Slughorn as proof that you can indeed be a Slytherin and still be a good guy. Well, setting aside for a minute that he considers being Muggleborn to be a handicap, not an insurmountable bar, but still a handicap, to becoming a skilled wizard, I otherwise agree. With that one exception, Professor Slughorn is a stand-up guy. Likewise, people tend to point to Peter Pettigrew as an example of an evil wizard who is a non-Slytherin. Again, I agree that this is a good example to use. However, here's the part that so many Potterheads fail to grasp. Slughorn and Pettigrew really are the only noteworthy examples of their respective exceptions. Yes, there are exceptions to every rule of thumb, but the rules of thumb still apply on a general level. Let me put it this way, if I knew nothing about a wizard other than what house they were in at Hogwarts, and I were then asked to predict whether or not that wizard was evil, it would be like if I were on the old US game show Card Sharks, was given a three or a king, and then asked to predict whether that next card would be higher or lower than that. I'm not guaranteed to get it right, but it is still a fairly safe bet. First, let's talk about the ideals and priorities of Slytherin House. A lot of people often consider Gryffindor House to be the polar opposite of Slytherin House, but that's probably because the vast majority of soldiers in the First and Second Wizarding War, aka those who fought against the Death Eaters, were Gryffindors because, yeah, you obviously need to be brave to put your life on the line like that, since the Wizarding World doesn't appear to have a draft for their army. However, going purely off the house's ideals that the Sorting Hat takes into consideration when it sorts you, I would say that Hufflepuff is closer to the antithesis of Slytherin than Gryffindor is. Hufflepuff's ideals are not being afraid of hard work and toil. Meanwhile, in this book, the Sorting Hat describes the ideal Slytherin student as being willing to, quote, use any means to achieve their ends. We see the ideals of Hufflepuff House on display in Prisoner of Azkaban, when Cedric Diggory asks for a Quidditch rematch after he realizes that he only won the match thanks to outside interference from the Dementors. As an ideal Hufflepuff, Cedric is appalled by the idea of winning or achieving success due to anything other than his team's own skill. Meanwhile, the Slytherins are willing to use, and this is a direct quote from the book, any means to achieve their ends, meaning they will likely take the path of least resistance to any goal. And if that includes cheating to win, well, if that's what gets results, then that's what gets results. Slytherins do not see any inherent value in following the rules for its own sake, 
not if following the rules is a less effective way to reach your destination. That, right off the bat, is a huge point in favor of saying that Slytherin, generally speaking, is evil. Even if Voldemort really is the exception and not the rule that he takes this ideal to an extreme never before seen, the fact that Slytherin House's priorities even encourage such a general outlook on life in the first place is certainly a gateway to more malicious attitudes that inflict tangible harm on others. But then we have the actual first and second wizarding wars. Remember, as I pointed out last chapter, there have surprisingly been no real wars in the wizarding community before Voldemort came along, despite that not making the slightest bit of sense. So unfortunately, we don't have very many actual wars to use as examples. However, in both of the Wizarding Wars, the Death Eaters were comprised majority of former Slytherins. Now sure, the good guys were comprised mostly of former Gryffindors, so you could argue that it's mostly a Gryffindor versus Slytherin thing, but it's really not if you think about it. All throughout the series, we see example after example of Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw siding with Gryffindor whenever it's a choice between Gryffindor and Slytherin. In this book, Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff are both happy to see Gryffindor win the House Cup simply because that means that Slytherin doesn't get it. In Prisoner of Azkaban, during the final Quidditch match of the season, the stands are described as being 75% in favor of Gryffindor, meaning that literally 100% of Ravenclaw and 100% of Hufflepuff are rooting, well, not for Gryffindor per se, but for the house that isn't Slytherin. In Deathly Hallows, when Pansy Parkinson wants to seize Harry, literally everyone, with no dissent whatsoever, from Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw tables turn their backs to Harry and refuse to allow any Slytherins to pass. The only time Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff aren't on Gryffindor's side is during the Triwizard Tournament, but that's only because it isn't a case of Gryffindor versus Slytherin, but rather a case of Gryffindor versus Hufflepuff. So no, all things considered, I have to go with the final verdict that Slytherin House is indeed evil. Are all Slytherins necessarily evil? No. Does not being in Slytherin necessarily mean you aren't evil? No. But one or two exceptions per generation does not disprove the general rule. On a general level, Slytherin is indeed evil. Deal with it. So after that discussion with Hagrid, Harry proceeds to buy the rest of his school supplies. Most of these don't really matter, though I do have to question why Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is on the list of books for first-year students when they aren't even eligible to take the class of Care of Magical Creatures until their third year. However, the scene where Harry buys a wand is indeed important to the plot, so I have to talk about that. Ollivander begins by measuring various parts of Harry's body. However, these measurements don't really help Ollivander predict what sort of wand Harry is most likely to bond with because a huge pile of tried ones piles up before long. I wonder if this is subtly foreshadowing that Harry is a horcrux. Now, the fact that he ends up being destined for the wand that has a tail feather from the same phoenix as Voldemort's is probably a foreshadowing that Harry is a horcrux. Harry bonds with that wand primarily because Voldemort bonded with its twin, but could it be that the body measurements normally do indeed provide an accurate and reliable prediction as to what sort of wand that wizard is likely to bond with? But the fact that Harry has a portion of Voldemort's soul living inside his body is what's screwing up those measurements? Something to consider. Hagrid buys Harry a pet owl and then treats Harry to some hamburgers. Harry gets a bit of a pep talk from Hagrid about the enormous amount of pressure that's been put on him, and then puts Harry on the train back to Little Wingy. The chapter ends with Harry being given another ticket to use on September 1st when he boards the Hogwarts Express. 
Draco Malfoy is the only main character that gets introduced in this chapter, and while we don't learn his name just yet, I have to say he makes a rather baffling first showing. He's meant to be Harry's antithesis for the rest of the series, a bully that Harry has to overcome now that Dudley isn't around. But does he really show that in this first showing? The narrator certainly wants us to think so, as the narrator tells us things like how the boy reminds him of Dudley, or how the boy doesn't sound sorry at all at the news that Harry's parents are dead. However, for the narrator to tell us these things is a violation of the rule of writing show don't tell. Going entirely off the dialogue in this book, Malfoy comes off looking rather affable and sociable. The closest he comes to saying anything ethically out of line is he doesn't believe Muggleborns should be allowed into Hogwarts. But this early in the story, a first-time reader doesn't quite realize just how out of line such a statement is. Everything else he says, assuming you take out all the parts where the narrator spoon-feeds us everything about his tone, seems like he's genuinely being friendly and conversational with Harry. Anyway, if you ever needed any further proof, that J.K. Rowling goes out of her way to present her antagonists in the most unsympathetic light possible, you need look no further than the names of the last three members of the Malfoy family. First, the surname Malfoy is French for bad faith, so right off the bat, the name Malfoy literally means malicious or ill intent. The first name, Draco, is inspired by King Draco of Ancient Greece, a king who is infamous for handing down extremely harsh punishments for the pettiest of crimes. It is because of King Draco that the term Draconian is often used as a synonym for totalitarian or tyrannical. Meanwhile, his father's first name is Lucius. Lucius, as in Lucifer or Satan. His mother's name is Narcissa, whose name is inspired by the Greek mythology character Narcissus, who was cursed by Aphrodite to fall in love with his own reflection, hence the word Narcissist, which is used to describe someone who is obsessed with their own looks. So the three members of the Malfoy family who play any prominent role in this series are literally named Evil, Evil, and Full of Oneself, respectively. Considering how consistent their naming scheme is, it's clear where Rowling's priorities lied when it came to writing her evil characters. It's clear that she is more concerned with giving her characters names that cleverly convey just how evil they are, than she is in actually giving those characters any kind of depth or complexity. It honestly shouldn't have taken more than a couple of hours of brainstorming to come up with believable reasons for why the antagonists of this series do what they do. Hell, I offered a justification of my own earlier in this chapter when I suggested that they feel resentment against Muggles for making them live in hiding. If I can do it, J.K. Rowling sure as hell can. But instead, she decided to spend that time and effort coming up with clever naming schemes for her characters. FAIL! Hagrid gets a really strong showing this chapter, which makes up for his weak introduction last chapter. He is shown to be compassionate and understanding, and gives exposition about the magical world when Harry can't simply observe it on his own, like the conversion rights for galleons, sickles, and canuts. He ensures Harry that he'll do just fine at Hogwarts, and Harry realizes that Hagrid has a kind, loving heart underneath his gruff appearance. Harry once again is relegated to the audience surrogate fish out of water. Get comfortable with Harry being in that role as it won't change for quite a long time. The closest Harry comes to character development this chapter is instinctively picking up on the fact that Draco Malfoy is much more of a smug prick than his dialogue would let on. Although even calling that character development is a bit of a stretch, as for reasons I've d already discussed, that could just as easily have just been lazy writing on Rowling's part. Well, if you found the controversial topics I discussed today to be refreshing, you'll probably love my next episode of the Harry Potter Retrospective, because my next episode is going to be hands down the most controversial episode yet, 
and will likely be one of the most controversial episodes in the series for quite a while. In this episode, I explained why Slytherin House is evil, which is only controversial because other people like Super Carlin Brothers have made it a point to defend the house. But next episode, I plan on eviscerating a character that the vast majority of Potterheads actually love. Tune in next time when I completely tear apart the character of one Hermione Granger. So, until next time, I bid you all adieu. Acer Thorn out. Peace!